evening. It's June 7th, 2022. It's about 7 p.m. I'm calling the Board of Selectmen's meeting to order. Uh, I am David Cortez, the Vice Chairman. Kevin Morse is not here this evening. Would you all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I have no announcements. Is there anyone here on a matter that's not on our agenda? Seeing none. Um, the first item we have is the reorganization. I'm going to ask the rest of the board if we can pass that over as yeah. we're missing one member. Any objection to that? Nope. nope. Okay. Item number two, discuss ARPA fund spending proposals and possible votes. Mr. Chairman, given that it is listed as 710 um, and that the crowd is yet to uh, file no. in, I wonder if we should uh, discuss another item until that happens. Okay. Sarcasm noted for the minutes. I have no objection to that. Let's go to item number three, review and discuss Highway Department Fiscal Year 23 paving plan and possible votes. Let me grab Adam. I think he's here for I think Adam is here for this. Sir. Softball, how they did? I'm sorry. Stuck in a gene. Along with bunch of stuff. That's all right. Any, uh, any news on Western Mass? Lost two to one. Three hour school bus ride. Yeah. So, no. Yes, I just uh -huh. got off the phone with them. All right. So, um, this is John's notes. I'll read it from his notes for paving. Um, as of right now, his budget, you, did you guys get any of this stuff? I don't know. Yeah, it's in the answer. Yeah. We have a breakdown, right. yeah. Perfect. We have his letter. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, his existing funds is 700,246.73. He ended up with uh, 360,000 for chapter 90 for FY23, 360,000 from town meeting, and 254,557, which is uh, RAP funds, which is Winter Recovery Assistance Program, which is to help with potholes and stuff like that. Um, so that gives us 1.674803 for a total. So 1.6 million seven hundred seventy-four thousand eight hundred three dollars after July 1st, of course. Uh, our recommendation to the board would be to pave Cemetery Street, which we did the water line a few years ago and we promised the residents that we do what plus uh, do Cemetery Street plus it's our PCI of zero, which is the top on our list anyway. Uh, Vine Street on the Pine Street end and Vine Street on the Southeast Main Street end. A few years back we did the middle already because that was the worst section. Um, Northwest Main Street from Oak Street to Ridge Trail. Southwest Main Street from Streeter Trail to the Grand Trunk. And then we would like the Crack Seal, Webster Street, Southwest Main Street and Cross Street. So basically with all that done, if we pave everything, now again this is by our 2020 payment study, which we know the fuel prices right now are outrageous, so right. um, the new prices will come in once we go out to bid and once we find out if we have any base issues that we need to address. Uh, we figure we're going to be around 565000 left, and we're hoping that money can go towards uh, Depot Street culvert or um, some other repairs that we need. Plus, we're going to have to update the payment management study next year um, to the new standards. Let's see, and I think that's it on this. And yeah, that's everything he had written down here. So that's where we're at right now. And if you'd like to go forward tonight, if you approve it, um, we have the engineer's bid, which was $65,200 for Matt to sign if you guys approve it so we can go forward with engineering of these roads. So all you need is a vote on the engineering budget tonight? Or? I, that, I, you know more than me on that, I think. No, I think you would vote on both. You'd vote to okay. approve the engineering relationship and then you would the vote to, to spend the money on the program. Okay. Now South Street, 
That's is correct. left off because, can you explain yep, why? Yeah, sure, so we had drainage issues. We have um, some drainage issues on Salt Street. We have some neighbors that are fighting. Uh, we actually, that was our goal with Salt Street, actually, in the original proposal. But the neighbors were fighting back and forth over this, the where the drain water goes. And we want to rectify the situation before we proceed any further. Um, and we want to replace a lot of the cross culverts. So we need a year to settle anyway, so it gives us time for all that. So that is on our next list, which will probably be next year. It'll give us time to fix that this year and then move on to that for next year. <laughs> You have Cemetery Street as a PCI of zero. Yeah, that's is the worst. Mandatory, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, is the next PCI Street Vine? So, or yep. Are there so, some in, in the middle? There nope. So, there? zero, then Vine Street, both ends. And then it's, we do have, we did skip um, when it hits Northwest Main. There is uh, the development off of Birch Street, which is um, Irene, Belvoir. Those are actually in there. But because it'll pass winter, those other streets kind of will jump forward when if we redo it. And there's so much traffic on those other streets. We have cars that are bottoming out on Southwest Main because the, the heaves in the middle now, the, their oil pans are rubbing. So, you know, there's damage being done to cars and where it's not on the smaller street. So we've moved it around ourselves. Yeah, there's some local flexibility, yeah. I would think, built Correct. into the plan. Good. Mr. Chairman. Yes. The engineering, does that include anything for South Street? That or does not. It? This engineering here is just for the pavement alone. The is there engineering, any engineering required for South Street? Correct. Yep. We, we did just receive a proposal that I actually don't have with, with me here um, from the engineer, and I don't know the number if you do, but um, we had it just today. We just received that proposal for South Street. Is that included in any of our numbers? No. Should we be um, considering that as well so we can move forward with that? Or is it premature on that? Well, we only got the proposal today, so I'd like a chance to okay. digest it. Yeah. I think <clears throat> what this is coming out to is that South Street is basically going to be a major project mm -hmm. as in comparison to these. So I think depending on what we certify in the fall for free cash, we might be coming back through for some funding for the engineering to set that all up and get that ready. <clears throat> but that's going to be, that will probably take the entire chapter 90 appropriation yeah. next year to do that street. So we want to be prepared. And it's only a partial. It's but not even the whole length yeah. of it. I think it was. It's, I don't even remember. March to. Yeah, uh, it's uh, Hemlock. It's the new development. Um, it's around 175 down to Hemlock, which in this 10 cross drains that we have to be addressed all the way through. So. Yeah. The cross drains are complicated because the road has lost its crown. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting an, an honest understanding of where all the water is going because having lost its crown, now it's running down the side of the street to the last one and flooding out those neighbors at the end who are not getting along. So we've, we just have a lot of work to do before South Street is truly ready. Solving the drainage problem, though, is going to solve a lot of the... It'll make the paving project have a longer life once it's completed, so we should do it. I think one of the issues is where we're going to dump all this water. Correct. That's, <laughs> that's, that's definitely the engineering part. Yep. Any further questions or discussion? Or? No. I think we're going to do two motions. I'd like to take a motion on the engineering. <clears throat> I'll make a motion that we accept the engineering work for a total of $65,200 for the paving plan presented to us tonight. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it. A second motion on the work itself. Seeing as any paving is good paving in the town of Douglas these Absolutely. days, I would be yeah. gladly to make the motion that we pave as presented for fiscal year 23. Second. Mm -hmm. Motions made and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? The ayes have it. 
Thank no, you. Mr. Chairman, if I may ask a yes. question for the record. So are they going to bid these out as separate projects or are you going to bid it out as one paving release? So one paving, one paving project. I think they're going to pave it, put it all mm -hmm. up together. Um, right now, of course, we've talked to a couple of paving companies and the prices are just yeah. astronomical. I mean, our, our numbers that we get in 2020 are not going to be close, unfortunately, right. but um, that's why we have that 545,000 yeah. buffer. Uh, so we're hoping we can take a, you know, we still have that left over so it gives us a lot of those. I would go wrong. Mm. All right. Thanks. Seven ten, right? Yeah. What color is the paving? Paving color? Yes, black. Let's go. Okay. Yes. Is that the cheapest color there is? Oh, I get. just want to make sure. Yeah, I'll outside of taupe. Henry Ford taupe. said you can have every color you, you want, want as long as it's black. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Absolutely. Skin color. All right. Let's jump back to item number two since it's passed. So, thank you, thank you. Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thank thank you, Adam. Nope. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. Um, item number two. Uh, had a time of 710 um, ARPA fund spending proposals. So, Mr. Chairman, you want me to do a lead in? If you would. So, the town will receive, by the time it receives all of its ARPA funds, about $2.7 million, of which I think in this memo somewhere. We detailed how much we've spent already, which is not very much at all. And there was a proposed process here. We are now at June 7th for a Board of Selectmen discussion to treat this as a public hearing with input from the public and to interview department heads on their various proposals. You've received all the proposals that are bullet pointed here in the cover memo. Uh, two from the town administrator, one from the school department, which actually dovetails with one of my requests. Eight requests from Adam for public buildings, multiple requests from the fire department, two from the town clerk, and one from the national fitness campaign, which came in through the through your chairman, but also it's, it's a national recreation uh, initiative. So that's where we are with this. Um, and the thought would be that the board would at least begin to familiarize itself with the various proposals um, and begin to determine how they want to, how you want to sort out the merits of each and which priorities. We will not have enough money to fund all of these. And I think what we're missing here is um, Bob Sullivan had a lengthy list of water department requests yeah, as well. Because um, <clears throat> he probably didn't copy you, but he did send it to me. But it was only yesterday. There's no way the board could have reviewed it at all. But <clears throat> yeah, you're going to end up with a good five and a half, six million dollars worth of requests for a $2.7 million budget. Um, but that's what we're here for, right, is to <laughs> make choices. So. Um, I don't know how you want to begin. I don't Do know. we have a list of the applications anyway? Yes, yeah, so the cover memo behind tab number two. If you had tabs. <laughs> <laughs> I have tabs. I have a binder too. The should be out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, tabs. Yeah, tabs. Yeah. Tabs are good. Right behind my tab too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting my tabs next week. <laughs> No, no, you, you don't need to. It you run the tab yeah. list. Yeah. 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 Keep tab yeah. on things. <laughs> Told you it would work. <laughs> Fire department, multiple requests. I see that. Just as a suggestion for those department heads are here, if you want to go to them first so they can leave. I think so. Chief? Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chief. <clears throat> Deputy? Hello. Um, there was a couple of requests that we haven't, that, uh, that aren't on that list because they came up in the past couple of weeks and we did some research to find out uh, what actually uh, would fall under opera, but um, for the most part, I'll talk first about um, a couple of the things that, issues we have with the fire station. Um, 
thankfully, and I want to thank the voters, but in the capital plan, we actually funded an engine and we signed a contract on that yesterday with uh, Mr. Wojcik and the company that um, we contracted with. And uh, so hopefully that should be here September, November at the latest. Uh, we were able to get one that was already in production and make some changes along the way so that it fits our needs. Um, we also were uh, requesting air conditioning and um, heat pumps get rid of the oil in our in our station right now. It's just uh, costing us a lot of money, but it's very inefficient. And uh, we have no AC in the building, even though we have employees in the station for 24 hours a day. Uh, we also talked about window replacement. And I know that Matt has talked about some of these things as well. And then doing some uh, uh, floor replacement of the apparatus, floor refinishing and whatnot. We also had in the... Uh, fire department uh, capital that we skipped over, and that was to replace the chief's cruiser. We'd like to, at some point, replace not my, just my cruiser, if possible, too, just because uh, we now have the assistant chief, and she's responding when I'm not around to calls that in her vehicle that she bought on her own that uh, doesn't even have a radio. So we had a call a few weeks ago in the campground where I was coming back from being out of town, and I didn't have my cruiser, but she... Um, she ended up going to the to the call, which was two uh, mobile homes in the campground that were fully involved that started a brush fire. Thankfully, we were able to mitigate that fairly quickly with the mutual aid, but it was very frustrating for her because she didn't have a mobile radio to talk on and the, and the, and the portable wasn't getting out. Um, I could hear her on Zello, which is our backup system that we had put in, um, but the dispatchers weren't hearing her. And so... Um, uh, my cruiser is going to be nine years old in the fall. It's got radios that are older than that. So we'd like to replace that and, and, and replace hers, and get one for her as well. Um, and I know we could do that off the state bid list uh, fairly cheaply. Um, those are the are really what we have as far as the building envelope and, and needs. Um, we did check as well for on the, uh, on the funding guidelines from OPERA. And there is a provision there that says that there would be a provision for police, fire, and other public safety services, including the purchase of fire trucks and police vehicles. So we know cruisers are eligible. Um, but what we really wanted to talk to you the most about tonight was a gap that, we, that has come to our attention. And that is um, recently we've seen a spike in our, the psychiatric calls and the call, violence calls that we have in the town. Um, so I can just find that here. So, in 2018, we had 38 psychiatric or abnormal behavior or suicide attempts. It was in 2019, it went up to 43. 2018, we had 38. In 2020, when COVID hit, we went up to 74, so we doubled. And then in 2021, we went to 76. We're already at 70. We're already at 36 right now. Um, and I'll get to why I'm going here, but um, we also, in, the, in, in 2018, in 2019, we were dispatched to a report of assault, stabbings, or gunshot wounds. 2019, we had 12 of them, three of which there was actually penetrating trauma from guns. Um, so what we're trying, I guess what we're trying to say here is that as a department that's responding to a lot of these with our police, uh, we also have a gap uh, that's come to light uh, since the Evaldi, Texas uh, shooting. And so looking at NFPA 2000, NFPA 2000 is the active shooter... 3000. Uh, and I'm sorry, NFPA 3000. It's the active shooter hostile environment response. And right now, the, the police have trained with Alice uh, in the schools in, other, in order how to, how to do a lockdown and keep the kids safe if they have to fight and run, they can do that. Uh, and I know this is an uncomfortable subject, but yet it's reality. It's the world we're living in. We want to do the best we can to protect the students and to protect um, the citizens, for instance, in situations like uh, an active shooter or a, ha a hostile environment. We have, we have 10,000 people that come through here on Oktoberfest, and we're very vulnerable, and we don't have any ballistic protection. The fire department has no ballistic or vest protection uh, regarding helmets and vests. So we see this as a gap. We'd like to partner with the police. I did talk with uh, um, Chief Miglianico today, and we feel that we need to get some training in this area, work together and train on this on a regular basis, both police and fire. 
but we also have to get the equipment. And it's about, I would say, $1,000 to $1,200 per, per guy. Uh, we got grant money on all our PPE, our protective for fires, but right now we have no equipment as far as these type situations, and we feel that this is a gap that we want to address and hit head on. Um, and we were identified as one of two departments in Massachusetts Fire District 7 that doesn't have any of this equipment, so um, we're behind the eight ball in terms of that. Yeah, that was over the weekend. There have, there are, there's maybe like five I talked to the gentleman who did that survey today, but obviously it's a hot topic. And, uh, you know, we just haven't been able to find the time to apply for a grant. They only come around every year or so to be able to do that stuff. So we feel that this would apply and this, this money would be helpful uh, to make our, our lives a little bit more uh, protected. And obviously there would have to be protocols that would be written, but I would say these psychiatric calls, these people with altered mental status, domestics, anything like that that we're already going on, it would have to be standard protocol that we, were, we would wear at least uh, the vest. And we would want to make them so that they could take a rifle round and also stab protection so that uh, we're protected because, you know, there's a lot of knives as well out there. But um, we certainly appreciate you guys hearing us out. And um, I don't think you have anything else to add. I miss anything? No, nope, you hit it. Okay. Chief, a, a couple questions. Oh. Any, any a number of the fire and police that you think would be covered? Is it the five ten? I'm how sorry. Many, how many people do you think you would be equipping? Well, for right now, I think um, I think we would, what we would want to do is we want to have a set on each ambulance, two on each ambulance, and probably equip all the full timers, myself and, and uh, Assistant Chief Manning, the deputy, um, and then maybe have another set of four on on the on the first due engine. <laughs> on the first two engine as a start. And then I think what we could probably do, we get ahead of the well, now we could start, you know, buying four sets of gear a year on under our additional equipment um, line item in the budget. Is there, has anyone looked at funding uh, from the feds? I know that for police ballistic armor for a while, the feds were paying 100%. And I'm out of there, I've been out of there for a decade now. But I think the majority of the money comes from the Fed. So is there anything we could expect, either for reimbursement or a grant, we could apply for? We could do um, EMPG, but it's only about $3,000 a year. So we could purchase um, some sets with that. Um, there's also a Homeland Security grant. Um, we have to apply through the Central Mass Regional Planning Committee. Um, and oftentimes those grants are only successful if uh, you're applying regionally. Regionally, so a bunch of municipalities. Um, so it's a little bit more difficult and it's not as high of a funding priority for the Department of Fire Services uh, safety grant. Um, they put other fire service equipment um, well ahead of ballistic yep. protection. So it would be more difficult for us to get and be successful on, especially the competitive grants. This would be one under the turnout gear, but over your uniform? Uh, it would probably would... be a, a vest that comes over your turnout gear, yeah. and there's, a, I guess, a, a cord you can pull to drop it. So okay. obviously you're not going to wear that under your turnout gear at a fire. It would right. be mostly for ambulance calls. So if we were dispatched to um, any type of, you know, guns, knives, assaults, uh, or a report of uh, a psychiatric issue, um, or even a drug overdose, the staff would have a protocol to um, wear it on those calls um, and then they could drop it uh, if they didn't need it. So it would be worn on the outside and in very rare circumstances would we be donning it with our uh, structural firefighting PPE, but it's not unheard of. There's been departments in other areas that have had to um, unfortunately fend off active gunfire while fighting a fire, yeah. although I would say that situation would be very rare in the town of Douglas. We hope. I, mm. I hope, but you got to find out how heavy body armor is, no. especially you know if you want it to, if you want it to be anti-stab and you want it to stop a rifle round. That right. that's going to be a thick piece of armor. Well, NFPA 3000 says you got to have level 3A, I think, 3A. in order to meet yeah. in, in order to meet the NFPA. And again, NFPA National Fire Pursuit, minimum standard. Right. We're not there, so uh, we want to make sure that it's just a you know it's become to the forefront in the past couple of weeks and we've thought about it in the past but you just get busy and you get thinking and then all of a sudden you get three is three in a row and and we talked about training together um, what happened in your you know down in Texas how that was all approached we you know I talked to the chief obviously 
we have a unified command, so it's not one one person making it. You know, could go down a travel way down a, a wrong path and you know not be able to get back. When you have a unified command, you have other people with experience that you turn to and you game plan. And you, you know, no one of us is as smart as all of us, and we're working together. So, um, I know. Chief Migliatico was all for this and feels that we need to get on the stick and start training together, but I get we get the equipment and the training as well. Mike, are these fitted to individuals? Yes, yes and yeah. no. Um, the vest that the staff would wear on ambulance calls on a more regular basis would be fitted to them, and then the armor that would be used um, more of an active shooter situation that would have the ability to stop a rifle round. Um, it's just basically a steel or ceramic plate. It goes in a plate carrier and it's more universal and not fitted to a specific person. And those are the sets that would ride around on the vehicle and we'd have a lot of them available for the staff that would respond if we unfortunately had a hospital Yeah, I was event. just specifically thinking about the ambulance because unless you have the same people on there, you're gonna mm. have to have multiple sets. Right? Well, that's it and a lot of a lot of departments, you know, again, this is the money that's not really wildly available. Most departments maybe have one or two sets for an ambulance, um, but I'd be looking to. You, you don't know. You don't know who you're going to get. So you want to have stuff fitted to people. Um, but it's just the world we live in, and it's becoming more and more complex and complicated. And just, you know, responding to environments that you just never thought in your lifetime you'd ever have to go to. But. Your main first use would be if your ambulance people, EMTs, are out on a call and they it develops that way. Otherwise, the protocol is police for it. What's the? Yeah, police always secure a scene, but you 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 know. But you come out on a you don't know what you're facing, and all of a sudden you Correct. see somebody shooting when you're. Things can Correct. change when yeah. you're in the middle yeah. of it. Or you're yeah. working on a patient that's overdosed. You give them knock in or whatever. Yeah. All of a sudden they wake up swinging. Maybe they mm -hmm. have a weapon on them. No one's yeah. really you know. It's just there's so many scenarios you can yeah. paint, and it's just you just have to be ready. And I know, I know you know that. <laughs> so um, I had another thought, but and it was my last thought, but I think it left me. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it has left the building. <laughs> it might be circling. Around. It may, it may come back, Chief. Yeah, yeah it probably will when I get back there. <laughs> Um, you don't have a written proposal on this with numbers yet. No, right. Oh, that's the point I was going to ask. That See, it the, came back. That's the yeah. point. See? Yeah. Uh, I was talking to Chief Coleman from Auburn. He had done the survey earlier this week. He's trying to get through a company in Worcester um, to try to bring departments like ourselves up to speed where we can do a bulk purchase of all this stuff. So we're, we're working through the chiefs of, uh, throughout the district to try to get the best deal and the most amount of bang for our buck. So. If we sized all the full-time staff um, for what meets NFPA 3,000, the minimum, um, the vest would be somewhere between three and five hundred dollars. So for the nine or ten of us, um, you know, you're looking mm -hmm. at maybe about four thousand dollars, which um, even our budget could afford because we were able to come up to speed um, in funding turnout gear purchases with grant money. So we would have that money in our um, FY23 budget next year if we need to go that way. What's our timetable on approving ARPA projects? One. We have three years from 24, it's got to be. Right, it's going to be out the door by December 31st, 2024. We have plenty of time then. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. There's no rush. Right? Yeah. All right. That's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. What else do we have for proposals? Mr. Sullivan. Bob, Mr. Here. Sullivan's here. Bob's here. I didn't pass around your memo, so can you speak to it in summary? And <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Who oh, sprung from his commissioner's meeting? How'd you pull that off? Uh, I told him this was more important. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> Um, all right, so I, don't, I didn't bring them with me. That's okay. So, Just, yeah, I think you can speak to. So I had four different projects that I had um, given a write-up on. So one, I mean, we've discussed the water main project, um, the, the water main from Franklin Street up to basically the, the Church Street tank. Um, we had we had Excuse me. put put an application into SRF to try to get money to do that. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't make the make the cut, but 
that project was about seven and a half million dollars um, from the engineering estimates. But that line is our kind of the artery of the whole water system. So all the water goes from the, the pump stations to the tanks, everything goes up and down that line. So we did a, a risk and resiliency study last year and that was identified as one of the key points um, just because it's, it's kind of the weak point. It's an old pipe. That water main was put in in the 50s. Uh, cast iron pipes life expectancy is about 70 years, so we're already beyond that point. But luckily, Douglas has good water, so it doesn't deteriorate the pipes as much as it does in other communities. So, um, but that was the key reason for that life expectancy, and because it is the key artery of the main, you know, the water system. So, um, that being said, we would increase fire protection. If we had a major break um, a few years back, we had a, a water main break on Mechanic Street, and it was a linear break instead of a circle break. So if we had one like that on that line, we'd probably drain the tanks in about an hour. So the whole town would be out of water, fire protection, everything. Um, and then we'd be playing catch up, trying to fill the tanks back up to get people water. So that's that project. How much so, is that? Yeah. About seven and a half million. We don't so, have that much. If we, if we gave you a third of that, where would you get the rest? So the rest would have to be done through uh, funding. We'd have to probably pull a loan through the enterprise fund to yep. uh, fund the rest of that. So, any more questions on that one? All right. Then I don't feel so great about our 2.1 million. Think, it's getting smaller and smaller, isn't <laughs> if, it? If you want the party to slow down, have Bob talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the other ones will sound yeah. reasonable. <laughs> no, but you're right to bring it up, right? Yeah. It's, it's an important pipe. Yeah. How many breaks have you had on that main? And uh, about 12. So there was one year that we had three on the same night. So that it broke down by the, the booster station near Glen, Glen Street, up by EU's property, and then over by Mr. Tapley's old property. So there was three at once. We were working one main break, and someone came down and said, oh, you, you got a water leak up there. And we're like, no. So we go up and check it, and then someone comes down and says, oh, you have a water leak up the road. And we're like, yeah, we know about that one in front of EU's. They're like, oh, no, up further. So, <laughs> so we had three, but luckily, like I said, they were circle breaks, not linear breaks. Those don't leak quite as fast, so we're uh, able to get those under control. So, yeah, about 12 altogether. Um, anything else on that one? Other questions or discussion? I think you kind of cooled the discussion with the money figure. I think that shut it right down. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. So on to project number two. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the second one, kind of in the same area, um, was to provide sewer service up to basically where the, the highway department is. Um, so that project, I mean, we've discussed it many times over the, over the years. Being an enterprise fund, we have to look at it as a business. And it'd take 100 years to even come close to recouping any of that money based on the volume that we would we would produce up there. So from the enterprise fund standpoint, it's not a feasible project, but we see the need for the municipal services up there for you know, the safety complex or fire department if they expand, the highway department if they rebuild. Um, we know the project that may go forward with the family convenience, so you know, might, might assist in that project there too. So like I said, for the, for the cost, we would never recoup that cost. So um, where the ARPA funds isn't something that you're trying to pull from tax base or the enterprise fund, it may be a viable project for something like this, and it would expand services. <coughs> What's um, the value of that? Uh, roughly two, two and a half million. So Mr. Chairman, just for members, appreciate. I will circulate Bob's written document immediately after that we meet tonight, mm -hmm. so you won't have to take too many notes. I just forgot everything. So a third project um, is lining some of the sewer system. So we haven't done any pipelining or any 
major repairs on any of the wastewater district uh, collection system, uh, probably in the history of it being installed. So we're getting some infiltration. So we're in the process of an I and I study. So it's an info and infiltration study. Um, we've done small phases of it, and we're just ramping up. Actually, I had a meeting this morning to discuss the next phases and, and kind of a plan to put it all together to move forward. Um, we've identified some areas that have more infiltration than others, so we'll focus on those areas, but um, another project that I looked at was lining pipes. So without having that study done um, and knowing the system, we're probably, we got about 12 miles of uh, collection system on gravity sewer mains. About half of that is PVC, which you don't really have the infiltration issues with as opposed to the AC pipe, the AC or the, 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 clay, the clay pipe. Um, so with the age of the clay and the AC pipe, those are probably going to need to be relined at some point. Um, so if you figured about half the system, six miles, six miles would probably cost about two million to line six miles of pipe. Um, I wouldn't look to take all of that through an ARPA project. Uh, in my proposal, I'd said about 500,000. We could get a majority of the, the main issues taken care of. And the purpose behind trying to take care of those at, on a project like this would be to free up capacity at the treatment plant for any expansion for the commercial base and stuff like that. So one of the, one of the things that I've discussed with and, and trying to push forward with the commissioners is that we look at something that was, the state tried to come out with a plan to, for, and I don't know how they came up with their numbers because their original plan was if you have any new commercial or big projects going on that they were gonna require that project to mitigate, like say they were gonna use 100,000 gallons of flow. Their, the DEP's plan was to require them to mitigate 400,000 gallons of flow of, of I and I. So they wanted like, four times whatever you're going to use yeah. in mitigation, which, you know, if we had 100,000 gallons, we don't even have 400,000 gallons flow to the plant now, so yeah. so you couldn't mitigate four times that. But I would like to implement some kind of program where um, <clears throat> at any big projects that come in, we would require some portion of mitigation. And I would look at it more, you know, based on the size of the project and what their flows are. Um, to do a percentage. So once we finish our I and I study, we may find a small section of pipe that has a lot more infiltration than a long section of pipe. So a small project, we could get them to do a small portion, which would mitigate a lot more I and I than, you know, if we had a long section, we could do a bigger project that has more fi more funds than the smaller project. So uh, I am working on putting something like that into effect within the water sewer department. So, like I said, so for about 500,000, we could get a majority of it um, and not have to worry so much about capacity. So. Um, and then the last one I had, is there any questions on that? Um, the last project was the, the water main out in Depot Street here. So that one ranges from like the lower portion from Martin Road down was early like 1910 era. And from there up was probably in the 50s. So again, we're far beyond the useful life or life expectancy of the lower portion and around the useful life of the upper portion. Um, that, pro that, that main is kind of the main line from the storage tank. So you got Franklin Street and then it comes down railroad and down depot. So anytime the fire department or we're flushing or a contractor gets onto a fire hydrant anywhere downtown or on the, the Gilboa Street side of the river, it always causes dirty water complaints on this road um, and issues up Martin Road. So Martin Road's a dead end. So the project, the way I proposed it was to replace the main up depot street go all the way to the end, and I know we have a, a right of way or an easement to go through that property at the end to get to Maple Street, and then go down and connect to Mark, so that would create a loop, okay. uh, eliminating that issue of running out of water if there's a main, a high flow down downtown on Martin, it would loop it to get better water quality, and with a new 
stuck the wire in main, we wouldn't have that tuberculation in the pipe that would cause the dirty water complaints. And part of that project, and we've discussed it uh, in the past, was your line coming into this building is a four inch main that serves as your domestic use and your fire use. So the water quality isn't as good coming into this because it's it takes a long time to, to turn that pipe over with the water for the domestic use. So I would propose running a new six inch main in for fire protection to get you up to where you would need to for the volume you'd want for uh, fire suppression in this building. And a separate line coming in for the, the service for the domestic use. And what was the value of that? Uh, that was right around two million. So I know members of the board know this, Mr. Chairman. I'm just saying that for other people's benefit. But so in terms of a long-term outlook for the future use of this building, it is a matter of dispute whether we should sprinkle the second floor, a matter which we're not confident we would win if we were to protest having to sprinkle the second floor. So if the thought is to maximize the use of this building for any municipal purpose, including expansion of police presence in the building and whatnot, it, the sine qua non is the, the contingency is doing the water project because we really don't have the flow to sprinkle the second floor without this improvement. That's just our connection from here to the street. Correct. There's enough flow on the street. Correct. It's, it's the, from town hall to the street. That's why I proposed putting that into this project. If we replace this main, I would. It would make sense. We'd be digging in the ground already. A lot of options. Other questions? All right. Thanks Thank you. for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Town Administrator, do we have anyone to talk on the phone and security system or the school department security system? That would be me. Oh, excellent. Um, I'd like to just finish off the fire station HVAC because I know the chief commented on it. But <clears throat> so I've separated it out and made it part of my request package because we are already doing a project at the station. So we're doing a standby generator and replacement of their electrical system. And it would be recommended that a mechanical engineer design <coughs> the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning at the same time so that the electrical engineer is incorporating the load for the HVAC system in their plans for the electricity for the building as an incorporated whole and not as an add-on or future uh, increase. <coughs> and the one thought here is that the design shop that's doing the electrical work, which has been picked twice now out of competitive process, has mechanical engineers on staff. So the added expense of doing HVAC with the shop we're already working on would probably be below the BFCC's threshold for involvement. So we wouldn't be going out for a design competition here, we would just use McRitchie. Um, <clears throat> so that's why I, I pulled in, there's a lot of procurement moving parts, I didn't want the chief to have to deal with, with that. We did do air quality testing in this building. It wasn't the most horrible result that you could imagine. There were spikes, there are times in the building when it's unhealthy. Um, because equipment's running, the prime event may not be doing the job, may not have been on at the time. But in the grand scheme of things, in terms of the quality of the workplace that we provide people who work 24 seven, you know, when it's 96 degrees outside, 98% humidity, um, just, just to be civil, we need a place that we can cool and have right. people. Uh, Above and beyond that, we have a lot of sensitive computer equipment in this facility that has personally identifiable information on it and other things that we would care not to lose. And we need much better air conditioning for our computer servers and other things that are there. So that's why that's on your list. This town-wide phone and security system and 
Superintendent Vieira's request for a camera security system for the buildings all comes together as part of one conversation. And it also dovetails with the public safety radio project. We were required to build out a dedicated circuit on fiber, a 10 megabyte ser uh, service at all these buildings. So we run it up to the high school, we have it here at Town Hall, and it runs down on the fire station. And the public safety radio will never, probably never use even one megabyte at any given time, even during an active incident. So we have all this bandwidth that we have to pay for just because we need to make the, the radio system work. So we started to have a conversation about enhancing the security arrangements of the town. Now there's a portion of this that I'd prefer to have an executive session and I'd notify the board of that. When we get to details about specific buildings and specific security measures, that is an exemption under the Open Meetings Act. It can be done in executive session. But by way of summary, I would say, we really don't have a single unified security camera system. We have different systems. They are monitored. They are not the most modern system that's available. If we had this dedicated fiber circuit to run all the traffic over, now we have, you know, 100% live all the time, and it can all be put into dispatch and toggled Yes. and recorded on scene with a DVR. So even if you're not actively being monitored by dispatch, you are actively being monitored by the camera, and the camera will record <coughs> the file that will be retrieved. <coughs> so the superintendent wants to enhance the total number of cameras and all of the angles and, and areas that he can monitor. We don't have, it's no secret, we don't have anything at the fire station at all by way of security. And our security here has been a, a hodgepodge of a couple of different systems. So that's the security piece. The phone piece goes along with it because frankly it's the same vendor. It would be the, the vendor would be placing all the equipment for us. <clears throat> we had two completely separate conversations that were occurring at a different time. The phone system in this building, you may recall it was on town meeting and it was approved and installed just when I started here in 2017. So it was approved during Mike Kuzinski's time and then Suzanne, being knowledgeable about this, implemented the project after I started with a company uh, that promised us basically a cost efficient way to band-aid the phone situation at Town Hall. Because we piggyback with the police department. So the two have to move together. We ended up, you know, using all kind of adapters and jacks to be able to work with the police department, change the extension numbers and make the system that works. The firm that we are doing business with is very limited in terms of their capabilities. And we eventually have come to a situation in the police department where there are switches that handle the traffic, the internet traffic to various secure sites and other things that the police department interacts with on a regular basis. When those switches become outdated, you need to buy new ones and provision them with computer language. These guys want us to spend like $30,000 on this. And we have an unused switch up here in the IT room that was only $3,000 and all you needed to know is how to provision it. So we've been running back and forth in this dispute with the vendor. And eventually the IT director, David Naglia, said, you know what, let's stop arguing with these guys and just go out and see what the marketplace can provide us at a reasonable price. And so we started talking to the phone contractors on the statewide bid list about the entire situation and moving all of our traffic onto voice over internet protocol and being able to house some of it on this public safety radio fiber network. At the same time we were having that conversation, the ongoing conversation with the school department came back up again. Every year when we do capital, the school department comes to the capital committee and says, can we have a new phone system for the high school? And it doesn't make the rating because they somehow make the place work, right? And so it wasn't as pressing as the other needs before capital. But it would be 
to our best advantage to upgrade their phone system at the same time as ours with the same vendor and actually now share a common phone system so that the school department basically they're on an intercom basis with us they don't have to dial out you know they dial three numbers they get whoever they want to talk to but more importantly we can share some of the backups the security and other things that go along with it so we priced all of that out and that's what's in your packet then that's the explanation for that for those three pieces are there any questions I have a couple but I think they're better reserved for executive session yeah I think Adam's still here. Yeah. Adam's still Just to go back to uh, what Bob was saying about the sewer line up to the highway garage, um, John and I actually put that in our request too because, you know, we have a cesspool or some kind of a tank, as Matt likes to say, some kind. <laughs> um, and I know the fire stations had issues with this septic system in the past. So, I mean, if you take into consideration you could have two septic systems that could potentially fail. I mean, it's a decent amount of money towards this project right. that we could tie into. Just yeah. So that was on our list too. Um, mine are a little simple, uh, simpler than the others. And I don't have any proposals at the moment, but uh, a lot of the units here, the AC units, because it was ventilation stuff, they're 28, 29 years old. Um, they're still running, knock on wood. I have to get them clean, they're coming tomorrow. Um, but uh, there's a lot of duct works, things like that, that needs to be replaced. Some AC units, we did the boiler, which is great, but they tied into what we already have. That was yep. the way it works. So, um, so there's a lot of units. The unit that runs the IT room is from 2007. You know, that one I'd like to get replaced because it has all the important equipment and we need to keep it cool in there. Um, so in these roof units up on the roof, again, all this stuff has all been patched out with the school's units. We've talked about using upstairs and utilizing that. So we'd like to try to look at um, replacing those units. We only have one that's running right now out of the four. Um, three of them, yeah, have been shut off because of gas leaks and rotted heat exchanges. So I have one. So I keep the doors open from the heat from down here goes up there and keeps it running for now. Um, that's pretty much it there. And then I have uh, the sewer main again, which we said for the municipal building. We've got some sewer stuff, old sewer pipes down in the basement here that they're really look crusty here and you know eventually uh i've had a couple of leaks nothing serious we have they have lead joints yep they come in and re let them and that's what we do um elevator wing roof we've discussed you know the main roof and seeing what prices if we get it and if we have enough we can maybe uh vote to reappoint take the rest of the funds and go to that roof if not we'd have to come back as a separate project um this adult social center director was discussing having um uh, sprinklers in her building mm -hmm. she, you know because they have a kitchen and the only question with that I have is because it's such an old building we'd have to do more of a um, weatherization of that building because that's a 1928 or I believe building and so I know there's you know voids and stuff like that and we don't want coal there with sprinkler pipes mm -hmm. as it is um, but we'd have to do some other work but that was one of the other things uh, we have some the classrooms upstairs the, we have a lot of old sinks. They were little kid sinks that were in all the classrooms for the kids. And there's all kinds of pipes and stuff that run in through the wall that I that are all just basically abandoned in place but still alive. <clears throat> if I they're, somehow they're all tied together, so if I shut those pipes off, I shut off the gym bathrooms. <laughs> so yeah, so that it basically uh, I don't. That's how the renovation went when they did the school in '96. So once I shut the valve off, I can shut it all off. But then I found out the hard way that I shut the bathrooms off in the gym when I did. Um, Those are the good old days when art class in elementary school yeah. involved hazmat. You needed a sink <laughs> yeah. in every classroom yeah. to wash everybody's lead hands. Paint, yeah. Lead paint. Exactly. Was... Well, um, <laughs> I, I did bring up one thing that I, I do have a concern, especially, and it does tie into upstairs use. We have a lot of storage in this building, paper storage. And it really, it, the weight is, you know, I don't know what the weight is. I'm sure this building is secure and sound. But, I mean, there's just every time I look up there, there's more. And we should definitely have some sign of a system, a scanner system. Right. So we don't have to keep all that. It, it, you know, I don't know. I'm not a person that knows technology or anything like that. But um, there's definitely got to be a system that we can get all that put in so we don't have to have that much fire load upstairs, too. Um, and, again, I think it was uh, the key system here in the municipal center. I've gone through with capital and for Mike. Our original locksmith, 
um, passed away, the Blackstone Valley Lock, when they had, we, they had used them, uh, Ricky did before. They, we have a Cava Peaks key system. That gentleman passed away, the license went away because he passed mm -hmm. away. The business was sold, one of the workers finally bought it after a couple of years of being you know, vacant. I, the only place I could get a key for this building was in South Boston. So, and that's the closest dealer for Cabo Peaks. The gentleman bought it. Uh, the worker took him a couple of years to get it. We used them. We started working on it again. He gets COVID. He passes away at 41 years old. You know, you need a new lock system when no. you survive two of the yeah, people. Yeah, so now, so now I'm back at that situation again where I'm good with certain locks because they're regular keys and I'm not with a lot of the other ones. So, oh, and it's, curse of the it's, lock. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a patchwork of key systems here. So. Yeah, so it's just something that you know needs to be addressed at some point. That, um, and I, I, I know it's on my capital, and I, I want to say it's around thirty-five or forty thousand, but I don't have it with me um, for all the key. They replace all the locks, and it'll all be under one system for this whole building: first floor, second floor, gym. Still mechanical locks, right? Still mechanical locks, yeah. everything. Yep, exactly. So basically, in like I said, we had the sewer line on here that we, John and I, both agreed. Just looking at the numbers, and if the highway garage <laughs> stays there, if we don't build a new building if we don't move you know that cesspool sh should be eventually addressed and if the fire station has a failure in any type we can have a sewer line a stub ready for them yep and they're not spending that much money so it does make a lot of sense in our uh, in our opinion but that's it I think I think thank you thank you so mr. chairman I I'm loath to do so because I don't want to make, make a mistake, but I will speak for the town clerk. Thank you. So, okay with you. Uh, her memo is largely self explanatory. I know that there's been conversation about Matt moving help you through it her you vault, or actually creating a vault for her in the old locker room in the gymnasium. Um, the way that space is configured and its location is actually ideal because we would have the f basic framework for what we need to install the vault. The cubic HVAs. space meets the state requirements. It's yeah. So it would be probably the most cost efficient solution. Um, I know there's concern here about some of the degradation of the documents and you know how it affects the employees who handle them. But the other piece of this is so much of the history of the town is not captured electronically. So these records are the last historical records from early times of the town. And you lose that if they disintegrate. Yeah. And that's really not, well, it's not good stewardship on our part, and it's not fair to the future because there may be some, you know, surprising how many times we've gone to these ancient records to find out who owned what piece of land and did town meeting accept this, that, yeah. or the other. And <clears throat> But more importantly, you know, as you grow as a town, this becomes your, you know, the institutional memory will only be around as long as the older people are around when they pass away. And there's no thought to go back to those records if you don't yeah, have yeah. a catalog. Present company excluded. Right. Well, because that's never going to happen to you. Well, We're convinced yeah. of that. Um, and then there's climate control for her storage room, which I have not seen before, but I understand is that there's. We have an un uncontrolled space, and we're trying to store things in there. And it's an older building. It, you know, it gets condensation, it gets wet, it gets really, really hot, really, really cold. Um, yeah, and the other issues that come along with it. She u utilizes those two closets back there for storage. She has safes in Jean's office for storage. All that stuff would be centralized in the one location, which would also open up these other spaces to be used for other things. So. That was the thought process. She had talked to me before because I was on capital about the needed as vault and the and we were sitting there talking and that idea came up. I showed her the space. She thought it would work. I got a hold of the town administrator. We looked at it together. Um, has accessibility to the uh, elevator, so if she has to move things. Yeah. All her. Where's her voting stuff goes now, up here or something? We bring it upstairs. It goes up to the second floor. All that would be all down there. So it kind of centralizes her, all her stuff. She has it everywhere. Where in is the this building. space? The locker room. The old locker room in the uh, gymnasium. If you go in there now, it's like somebody opened the door, threw all this stuff in and shut yeah. the door. It's, 
There's recreation commission stuff right. in there, but it, a lot of it seems to have been aging for quite a while. Yeah. Um, she also. I think if we consolidated it at all, we could move it to another space. She also and, uses closets within those storage closets within the gymnasium, which would become available as yeah. well. And to Adam's point, and and Ken Frazier, the building commissioner, has been one of the leading voices in this because a lot of the records up there are. Did we building get, department did we records. get his scanner approved? We got. Did we get a project approved? I thought it was a scanner uh, and a monitor. Maybe we may have gotten the hardware, okay. but there's still a tremendous amount of labor yep. involved. And um, a professional archivist needs to be involved to save us a lot of time mm -hmm. and redundant effort. Uh, to make sure that as the documents come out of our existing paper file system that the electronic system is able to capture them effectively and be cataloged so that you can find things after the fact. It doesn't help to have everything go to a mysterious tiny URL. It's got to go to a, you know, a catalog where people can find what they're looking for. Um, we have and, staff on that within the library system. We right? do. Any further discussion on the town clerk's proposal? I'm intrigued by the last proposal. So, for quite a long time now, this national fitness campaign has been reaching out and asking if Douglas would want a grant to build basically an outdoor fitness gym, which of course becomes free of use to all residents quote unquote democratizes fitness by making it accessible to anyone who can't afford or a gym membership or doesn't have a car to drive to a gym. They have their own location algorithm they would want to be located where largest part of the population could ride their bike <coughs> within 10 minutes and be at this place. And so they've been looking at Douglas for a long time. And to be honest, <coughs> I've consistently put this in the bottom of my inbox because their sponsor in Massachusetts is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts. We are not a client right. um, and I venture to say we may never be <laughs> based on the way they treat some of their clients including Douglas in the past. And so I wasn't wild about picking a partner and feeling like maybe there's a quid pro quo or something else you know associated with this relationship and having to brand a product and advertise it when we don't use it. However, you know, that's just one person's peccadillo. The, the proposal itself, when you f go through this slide presentation, and the pages aren't numbered, of course, but midway in here, there's a pretty nice picture. Um, the bottom right-hand corner, it's somebody holding a mobile uh, uh, an iPhone with the app it says how it works. So basically you, you download this app and then you download individual workouts and it programs the time that you spend. But that's a nice picture of a facility that's been built in San Francisco with a commanding view of the Golden Gate Bridge. I don't know if we're going to be able to compete with that. Hmm. <laughs> We in Douglas, have new, we have the North bridge Street Bridge, and well, we have a new one up on Cedar Street. Cedar Street. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Is that the huge? huge it's bridge? the it's the cables. They were so romantic, and the fog coming off the Bad Luck Pond outlet. Yeah, well. um, <clears throat> but each successive page, you can see the equipment is very durable. It's built to be outside. It's built to take a certain amount of abuse from uh, bored teenagers, I guess. Uh, <laughs> And they're about 38 feet by 38 feet in size. And then when you come through to the end here, you can see, I hope he included the slides with the pricing. They're offering $50,000 grants. The program itself is 142,000 plus installation. So the, the town would be on the hook for about 117 to 137,000 to build one of these in addition to the $50,000. The grant. initial cost. That's the initial cost, yeah. And then you have the maintenance, whether it's clearing snow or... I mean, I can certainly inquire, yeah, right, clearing right. snow. No, you have all, all, it's going to create 
additional work for the departments that are it becomes an asset to keep up with what they have on mm -hmm. their plate now so you have to hire more personnel to true. maintain this thing but as I said previously it survives the giggle test because we are as a society trying to get people outside you know if we had a resurgence of whatever kind of pandemic or respiratory illness you're outside you're not in front of somebody you're not sweating all over people around you and as mentioned previously it would be free right it's out there it's a public asset anybody who wants to use it can use it um, so that's why it survived the giggle test. I don't know if it stacks up to these other it seems like a nice things idea. that we talked about here tonight. Nice but. idea in a warm climate. I don't know how you just don't True. understand how it would work in the Northeast. It would be a limited use. We could always, one of the towns that won a grant was uh, Tewksbury. We could see how Tewksbury makes out with it. Yeah. Come back to it in a couple of years. Thank you. Any final discussion on any of these items before we move on? Uh, just, and just in general, with the with the opera funds, uh, aside from um, the safety equipment that was suggested by the fire department and the projects from the water and sewer department, all the other stuff is pretty much on capital, and you have a projected five-year plan that's uninfluenced by any of these funds that has already gone through the process and, and scored where they scored, you may want to consider looking at that before you make judgment on w in which direction to go on with these funds. Because there's other things like the uh, oil tanks, which it's a sore subject right now for oil <laughs> spills in, in town, but uh, the school department does have two tanks at a uh, price of $140,000 each that are on there for 10000 gallon tanks. Whether or not they need 10,000 gallon tanks is up to discussion, but that's what they have on there for their list. That's all I have. I would like uh, the board to add to the list um, a concerted look at creating an access road between the schools. Uh, I know we've talked about it, and like all things, funding becomes an issue, but I think that's been identified as a, a real priority. And yeah, it doesn't seem like the solar guys are going to put it in anytime soon. I was just going to bring that up, yeah. yeah. If they were ready to break ground tomorrow, they wouldn't be able to get the, all the panels they need for a field of that size for a couple of years. So, <clears throat> yeah, we're backing off thinking that a solar development is going to do this. So the road wouldn't be very long. It wouldn't need to be built to some highway standard at all. It just needs to be passable for emergency vehicles. And um, Bill kind of had priced this out a long time ago using old prices um, at up around $150,000. I would only throw that number out there to say even if it doubled, it would still be very doable within the ARPA budget. So we're I don't know how the board wants to proceed. I mean, I can draft up a scoring system, but I would want some guidance from you on what you think is important to be put into the scoring system, uh, unless you feel like you just, you can look at the individual project proposals and is, sort them out. Is it possible to use a scoring system that we use for capital that we already have set up? Some my, my, only, basic my only fear there is you might end up with the same result, right? Okay. And I think that this is a different kind of opportunity. Capital is this annual town meeting item. Mm -hmm. And if we're staying ahead of the curve and we're generating sufficient free cash every year to support our capital budget, it'll be methodical and responsible and following that scoring system over the long term. In the short term, this is quite, frankly, it's OPM, right? It's other people's money, it's the federal money. It's an opportunity to do a project that may not necessarily score at the top of the capital rating system, but would still be, for the lack of a better term, a force multiplier for the town. Something that generates huge efficiencies, but may not be an immediate public safety or, or other necessity. Uh, or, frankly, may be too pricey for any one year. Because if we know that the capital budget will be right, stuck at right around a million, 
Yeah, that's what we had here marked 1.1 million, assuming that it maintained the same. So if we have really vital projects that are closer to 2 million, maybe ARPA is the opportunity to do it mm -hmm. without having to drain the capital budget two years in right. a row to, to accomplish it. Yeah, because if it's less than that, uh, if you if you address the the top rating capital projects, the other one would just move up, up the list. That's all that's going to happen to it. So it's yeah. The other piece, too, and I know we're moving forward with economic development, but I'd like to hold off on some of those monies just in case there's a unexpected need or shortcoming that we might be able to backfill. Well, that goes to timing. I'm hoping that within the next four weeks we'll have a lot more clarity around what we would have to do for the projects that we've already scoped out and engineered. Um, I was going to get to this in my report, so I'll just jump to it now. <clears throat> the federal grants, you know, we, we have to remember, we can't be like McDonald's customers, right, honking the horn after 30 seconds in the drive-through. We only finished this application on May 8th and submitted it to the federal government. The EPA. The, the EDA grant. Yeah, so, I mean, it's only been 30 days since the, the rolling grant period closed and they were able to have their own committee meetings and forward it to the secretary. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we have to be patient and give them a chance to go through their process. At the same time, we've been urging them to be quick because we're getting to the end of the, by the time we bid all this out, we'll be in the middle of the construction season. Mm -hmm. So the, we've got to squeeze a lot of work into a compressed time frame this fall. And so to do that, we need a decision from them in July at least. So <clears throat> if we don't get those funds or they don't give us all the funds we've asked for, then ARPA, frankly, will be the only way we do that. And we have made some commitments to development partners. Right. So we basically wouldn't make a final decision on ARPA keeping it as, as, uh, as, 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 as a backup. But we could say, if assuming we get that, then we're going to put it here and there. Okay. Just for clarity, December 31st, 2024, the, it has to be uh, paid invoice closed out by that point. I don't think so. I think it needs to be obligated or encumbered. Yeah. yeah. The work can go on into later capital, yeah. later years, but you have to have the contract signed and the money tied up exactly. by December yeah. 31st, 2024. Unless they change the rules. Well, they'll, they'll probably change the as, eligibility as today, rules as after, today, we, that's what after we fund all our projects. They'll come back and change the eligibility rules and try to claw back the money, <laughs> which is what they're doing with everything else. I don't know why they wouldn't do it with this. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be the <laughs> on the front end of ARPA spending. So I, <clears throat> I will clarify or attempt to clarify a difficult point. The federal government has already changed course once on ARPA. When the money was first released by Congress, the United States Treasury had this restrictive set of eligibility criteria. Then they backed off because I think they got a lot of negative feedback from the country. All entities, which would include Douglas, that got less than $10 million in ARPA funds may treat the generating event as lost revenue, right? Revenue that we did not gather because of the pandemic, so revenue replacement. And anything that is revenue replacement is going to be general government services. So it can be all the things that Chief Vincent listed, really almost anything to do with our operation of providing general government service to the taxpayers of the town. Our consultant has advised, however, that as we consider projects that we give some extra weight to those projects that would have qualified under the original rigid set of guidelines because that is probably the last thing an auditor would disqualify. So expansion of water service was one of those favored categories of projects. So anything you do with ARPA money under revenue replacement that fits in the category of water service extension is probably never going to be challenged or clawed back by the feds because they told you twice you could do it. I wish I could be less cynical, but 
as time progresses, this happens every single time we get FEMA reimbursement or other federal uh, grant programs is they tell you, go ahead, spend it on this, spend it on that, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then they come back and you're on a desk audit and they say, well, what did you spend it on that for? Well, it's because you said we could. Yeah. Oh no, I, 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 you know, where's your documentation, where's all the rest of it? And this is a, has happened several times over the last 10 years of my career and it gets a, a little bit, it makes you very cautious about what you recommend because you don't want to see a community have to come back after the fact and pay it back. And we saw what happened to now. There were errors in judgment in Methuen, mm. right? There's some, probably some really bad policy made there, but they ended up having to spend out a whole year's worth of free cash just to make up for money they gave out thinking that they could and they were not allowed to, uh, to their employees, because you're not going to recover it from your employees. <clears throat> the other aspect of this, Mr. Chairman, that I haven't broached is we had entertained conversation with employees about hazard pay, yes. and we have learned that the time period that we discussed with our employee unions is not eligible for ARPA use. ARPA is only March 30th or March 3rd, 2021 and forward. And we were looking for the hazard period in the 2020 time. Prior to that. So we are going to have to go back and talk to our employees about how to structure that proposal um, with a, basically a different metric being used to determine who would be eligible and for how much. Uh, that's disappointing. So I spent three or four runs at different state officials in different webinars and whatnot to get them to back down. <laughs> now they, yeah. they just got more and more clear that that's a bright line rule, that nothing before March 2021 is going to be considered as eligible. So. Yeah, that seems to change that game a little bit. What, um, oh, I had a thought for the chiefs. Uh, Rep McKenna was here a couple of me. He said the, the lawmakers are going to have some ARPA money to dole out to. The uh, best might be something that they could get behind. They want to check in with them. Just a thought. That's a, moving on. Number four, discuss public safety and highway needs reports and next steps. I'm looking to the chairman of that committee. Well, that's fine. Um, so the uh, reports have already been submitted to this to this board. Correct. So you know the findings of everything. So now it's just in limbo waiting to find out what the next step is. Are we going to send it for design? Are we going to, what are we going to do with it? I, we I, identified the need. So do we want to... Uh, mm -hmm get some input from a design professional to see what the uh, options are for all three departments. The real chairman not being here, would anyone object to tabling this till our next meeting so that he can participate? That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. I just, at some point, I would like to address it because we've been, oh, it's not we've, we've been doing this for quite some time. Yeah. So um, it's just, the longer it takes, the longer it's going to take to get started. We're sitting there with a trailer outside the highway department. It's just yeah, yeah that can't stay. Um, Went to right. be here before we know it, and we'll be scratching our heads still waiting on it. A, a oh, couple can of use that in the winter, can you? Oh, of course. You can no, use it's it, all you wired can use up. Use it in the winter. That's not the point. <clears throat> no, it's the longevity of it. You right. know, and and we, we want to make sure that people don't get comfortable with a temporary solution. That was designed to solve a specific an problem, immediate problem, an immediate yeah, problem, yeah. not to be a long-term solution. And, and to coat over the problem, the problem is we need a new highway barn. <clears throat> the classic formulation, I have two thoughts for you, Mr. Chairman. Just, I don't think it's going to step on the chairman's feet at all, even if he's not here. The classic formulation of this, and we've seen other towns nearby do this, right? Hire a design professional to consider two alternatives and to fully th document two alternatives. One would be the building of a central facility location with all of the information that's already been gathered by Selectman Fitzpatrick's committee and incorporate that into their the beginnings of a, a conceptual design mm -hmm. and compare that to the costs of rehabbing existing facilities, perhaps building 
a smaller facility for one of the departments as an alternative. North Smithfield recently did this with, shall we rehab the old police station or shall we build a new one? Um, my only caveat with that kind of process is that, well, North Smithfield is a very political town, right? So it was slanted. The study really to be useful has to be totally data driven and objective. So we'd want to have a lot of input from a lot of different voices on that. And that this would probably go through building facilities committee to make sure that it wasn't weighted in one direction or the other, that all costs and all benefits were given the same weight for both. And just go with the result regardless of how you felt at the beginning, right? Because it, if you un uncover issues that are important that need to be dealt with, then you might want to change your mind based on the data rather than use the study to direct a result, which I think unfortunately was the case in West Smithfield and why it right. imploded politically. Um, the group that didn't get its point of view represented in the report mobilized and, you know, shot the whole thing down. So when you say weight things out, you mean from the design or from the committee? As far as being weighted one way or the other? You said hashing, uh, just identifying whether it was slanted one way or the other. So uh, using only the example, because I think it's a yep. good straw man, yep. there, were, doing this to try to help there were help. benefits to fixing the old station mm -hmm. that the consultant in that town did not take into consideration because the he missed, he read the political impetus to be to build a new station. So he built the case for a new station and only did lip service to the concept of the old building and didn't show any of the downside of the of a building a new building. So that was that's how it should all be weighted the same. All every dollar of savings or expense on either side of the conversation should be weighted the same. Should be a dollar. Yeah. Right. I'd ask the chairman of the committee, I don't think that any serious consideration, and tell me if I'm wrong, yeah. was given to rehabbing the existing buildings or rehabbing the space downstairs that the police use. No, I mean, no, I think it, the question is whether we do separate buildings or one complex. It, 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 well, I think it, it's is that a fair assumption? Yeah, so if I can explain to you what what my goal was to it, and I, and I terrorized those two back there and, and Adam as well and, and the other ones that were involved in it. I was very adamant about the fact that I don't want to hear about any design. I don't want to hear about building shapes or anything. Just give us a menu of what your right. needs are and what your future needs are going to be. Tell me if you need a meeting room, how many people do you need in that? Don't tell me you need a 20 by 50 room. You need a meeting room for 28 people um, because there's a math formula for that. That way we had a very clean, clear menu for a design professional to take that, whether it's one building, two billion buildings, or three buildings, renovating, building new, whatever it is, we, that I kept that away from them. As Adam came in with a, with a drawing the first, the first meeting, and then I had him throw it away. I said, that's not what we want. Um, and we went through the process, we went through it very quickly in five meetings, and you have a very good report from all three departments. They all did a very good job identifying what their actual needs are and the projection over 20 or 30 years. So there is no, there was no discussion or thought process as to whether we're going to fix it, do one, do two, do three. We just all, the whole purpose was just identify what the needs are so we had a clean report to move forward. Yeah. So now I'm just trying to get it to the next step, whatever that happens to be. That's this board's decision now. So the design professional would be tasked to take the needs list right. and either do a concept, or actually do both, a conceptual picture of what it would look like all housed in a new facility versus can your existing facilities handle those needs? And if they don't, how would you do it? Would you build an addition? Would you move people around? Would you rehab the second floor of this building? And then at that point, cost it all out. But the, the, the initial needs assessment is the part that most towns skim over. That, that they that's should. where they fail. It's they, they turn around and they say, Mr. Designer, what do I need? Yeah, and he right. comes and he builds his portfolio and it's not what you need. Um, we did a different approach. 
this is what we need. Figure out, can you tell us how you can fit this into one structure or multiple structures? Makes sense. So that was so the mentality behind it. The second point I'd want to make here is there is a, nece a necessary financial discussion. Oh, yeah. And we have not even broached this with our financial consultant at this point. It may very well be in a horrible time to go to the market and borrow. And that may end up having a really overweighted influence on your decision in the end. Um, we may, we certainly have missed a window. Um, if we had been able to act for fiscal 23, in other words, if we had done this back, because if we hadn't had COVID, right, and we were marching the ball along at the same pace in 2020, we probably would have broached the conversation in 2020, done a lot of the feasibility work in 21, and 22, we would have building design and a bond out to bid at almost paltry overnight rates of almost 0% on the bond, right? Call it 3.5% money. But if we find that the Fed will use interest rates to control inflation, yeah. depending on the strength of those inflationary forces over time, you could see interest rates for a municipality, even with tax-exempt munis, at 75 8%. And do you really want to saddle the taxpayer with that kind of expensive money? Even if we thought we would have the financial strength to refinance after 10 years, mm -hmm. you would still have those first 10 years of a fairly large amount of interest on a fairly substantial borrowing. So <clears throat> I think what we'd be looking for from the select board in terms of guidance is maybe we take this time while we're trying to sort out the economy to do all this design work. And we need to set. identify. But we still have, have to talk to a financial consultant the, about what we see. The said. other part of the equation is to make sure our economic development projects are actually going to produce the revenue we anticipate. Right. And how much, yeah. right? So yeah. to the extent that we are already hearing rumblings about additional development, if it doesn't materialize, it has a big difference in our ability to raise revenues and pay off debt. But what we're doing is fine, at least to get the needs assessed and then pull the trigger once some Well, because we have an immediate concern with the highway department that's yeah. uh, because of the situation that right. we have a temporary structure out there. Yeah. We need to do something with it as, to figure it out. Perhaps that could be the first phase of the larger project, you know. If well, that, that's what my suggestion is, is if you engage with a design professional, you can look at it as a whole and give you, he should be able to give you a menu as, as to which way he would, you have options, whether you're, you're rehabbing a building, adding onto a building, uh, tearing it all down, building a new one, is it in the current location, is it down the street? If you build in the current location, now we're faced with the problem that you have fire suppression needs that you can't achieve up in that area, is that correct? Up where you're currently at, you don't have enough flow up there for fire suppression, so you'd have to do a cistern or something like that um, to satisfy that need. So it's, it's a point it's I was trying to make it's earlier. A, it's a big problem, but yeah. it, uh, by ignoring it, it isn't going to go away. We have to talk about it at some point. So. It's the point I was trying to make earlier. I don't think we have much of a foundation to build on with our, our existing buildings. Mm -hmm. I think we're probably looking at some new construction. Okay. <clears throat> Part of that discussion, it'd be helpful to know how much debt's rolling off over the next couple of years. I mean, We can get that report for you. I think after this, after this year, we won't have debt roll off for a while. We're pretty much going to be down to the schools and the water sewer. Yeah. But so there's a conversation there too about capacity, and there are, I don't want to call them magic formulas, but there are, there's a sweet spot where municipal government should be, and how much debt it manages to have. Not all debt is bad, but a lot of debt isn't any good. You gotta be in a spot where you can handle it. And you don't wanna suck up that capacity with excess interest 
right? So um, the note that's rolling off in fiscal 23, and you see it in the budget, is about a little over $400,000 a year in debt service. So taxpayers won't see that in their bill this year, it was excluded debt, so that's going away. But it won't happen again. We won't even, we're not gonna be in a position to refund any bonds anytime soon. What we've been able to refund have been, has been refunded. Do we want to move on? Any further discussion or? That helps frame it for your next meeting. I think what yeah. Lisa and I will do is take these minutes and um, summarize them into a memo and then try to refine the issue. So you have a motion to vote on. All right, Mr. Chairman, can I make a suggestion we pass over the next two items? Um, review yeah. the code of conduct uh, where the chairman's not here and also the appointments. Okay, Agreed. any objection? No. Nope. Okay, we'll pass over five and six. <laughs> Seven, discuss reappointment of land council and possible votes. Mr. Administrator. Your appointment of council for the town is an annual appointment that is renewed each June. However, the general bylaws of the town provide that council serves at the pleasure of the board. So really, you can make a change at any time that you think is necessary. In, in the case of land council, my recommendation to the board is that, not that you make a change necessarily because quote unquote you have to or this is awful. Or I think if you look at the pattern we followed over the last several years, we've shopped out property and casualty insurance. We found a different solution for health insurance. We have revisited most of our major vendor relationships. In the case of land council, it may be helpful to the board to conduct some interviews and just get a sense of how you feel about the situation after interviewing your zoning board, your conservation commission and your planning board and staff here as to whether or not the needs are being met and whether or not we feel like we're getting the guidance we need and whether the guidance is accurate. You know, and I don't have a particular bone to pick with any of our, with labor, general, or land use council, except to say that as going back to the budget conversation, if we had had the resources, I would have liked to have, have approved a larger budget for legal advice. Because it is my, I do have one strong feeling, which is that Regardless of who our land council is, we don't get enough of it. We frequently go into meetings where items are being contentious and the applicant will have legal counsel present mm. and our board does not. And so, frankly, they never reach a decision at that meeting because they feel like they have to shut down the conversation and go check with legal counsel. Yeah. The, res the issue is postponed for a month and then may or may not be resolved because maybe our lawyer couldn't make it to that meeting. And it's just an extremely inefficient way to run the land use function. So that's my primary concern. My secondary concern is, and this is a subtle point, but it's very important over the long term. Staff, not a single member of our staff is an attorney at law. And yet, many times in meetings, they are turned to to provide either parliamentary advice or legal advice on the interpretation of the regulations. Staff is here to provide recommendations based on our professional involvement with those regulations. You can't then turn around and say, well, is that the proper interpretation? Well, I just gave you my interpretation. And I think it's especially difficult in parliamentary matters or matter of open meetings when staff has to step in and, and feels that they know what the standard is and then engages in a back and forth, an unhealthy dialogue with the chair over what the body should do next 
under the rules. Okay. That puts a, an unnecessary tension point between the volunteers and the staff that serve them. That That's what counsel is for. Counsel should be able to say, no, that's you cannot have a motion to reconsider now. It's out of order because of this, 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 and this. Right. And not have staff engaged in this di dispute back and forth with the chair. Um, so if we're going to spend more money and we recommend that in the budget, I'd like the select board to feel comfortable as the appointing authority that whoever you pick to be that firm will have the capacity to provide us with more service and to give you a chance to review some of the specific case instances where we may not have agreed with land council, give land council most importantly the opportunity to address the issues. Um, so you would certainly have a process where the incumbent would be involved. Probably that your first interview would be with your incumbent and to go over all the issues and discuss all of the operational needs of the town and get some assurances of whether or not they even want to do it because they may not want to. Um, <clears throat> and then you could have other interviews just to get a flavor of it. But that's oh. that's pretty much why this is on the agenda. Are we looking at compensating them differently rather than a flat retainer? And it sounds to me like this leads to a place where you're going to need conflict counsel. Mm. And are they going to be able to do that within the firm, the infamous Chinese walls, <laughs> or are they going to have to farm it out? I, I, I think I right. don't have any problem with what you're saying. I just think that we have to restructure how basically the compensation is going to occur and what we expect. If we expect conflict counsel, we have to have a conversation with whoever, the incumbent or whoever is up, as to how that's going to be handled and who's going to pay for it. Right. Right now with land use, we have a flat rate, flat rate arrangement and we pay extra for extra services. So um, in particular cannabis. So there's a partner at that firm that advises the town of Douglas on cannabis matters and those rates are paid on an hourly basis and are not part of the flat rate. The flat rate, from my review of the warrants, it includes litigation. But there is a, it's litigation arising in the ordinary course of business. Course of business yeah. If we're responding to a complaint, I th uh, a direct complaint, I think we're paying the hourly rate for some of that work. Uh, or we could be, if it's above and beyond the agreement. Uh, it's 2500 bucks a month. I've kept track of what the hourly rate works out to on the monthly billings, and sometimes it's very low because they just work a ton. Right. And then, especially now in the summer, we're paying 2500 bucks, and we may not get, you know, much more than 50 hours mm -hmm. that month. And so it's a really high rate. It does seem to end up being their target, which I think is 185 an hour, um, which is substantially lower than Labor Council, which is always hourly. I think they're up to two, they just went up to 260. That gives you a sense, too, of how many meetings a month are they obligated to? One. One meeting. And we have two planning board meetings. We have one right. zoning board. And how many conservation? At least one. At least one. So that's, that's my point. So this is a major revamp. So, right. So you go back 10 years, there wasn't a, a big need for a lot of just very average uh, setback and things like that. Now we're getting pretty involved in all this new development and stuff. They're just not contracted high enough to support what we need. Following on Mike's thought too, I, you think some of this, if this you know, results in increased legal fees for us at, at whatever, you know, flat rate, hourly rate, some of this is going to be liability avoidance. Yeah, I, really, I feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've We've been fortunate, yes. knock on wood, to this point that, uh, you know, it's a small town, so people are still trying to get along. But if you get to the point where you have a couple of litigious parties, um, I've certainly seen opportunities where people I've worked with in the past would have filed the lawsuit in a heartbeat right. and probably beaten the living you-know-what out of us because just we're human beings. You know, the, these boards make mistakes from time to time. 
um, that were avoidable. I think would, is what I would yeah. put it that way. But other, other than the planning board, everybody's a, a volunteer. Yeah. And even with the planning board, those members, they're, they're limited to the meetings and, and what they're going to. So you do the best you can with what you have. I've been on zoning since 2013, but you're still learning every meeting. Seems That's dangerous. Right. So, so I, I like having town council there myself because that helps us during different things. I'm accustomed to a much more diligent and professional recordation of findings of fact. And I think that's where, when we get appealed to a court, yeah. that is the primary weakness that has resulted in a remand of our cases back to us, is that we didn't lay the foundation in facts. And that's, in a lot of land use meetings, that's the value of counsel. All right, so what are you basing this decision on? I'm just here to help you guys. Right. You know, you got to, it's really basic logic, but you build up to the point where you can re reach a conclusion. And too often they just jump to the end and they want to make a decision because they, they've made up their minds. But they really have to be, you have to be type A about getting those facts down on paper, submitting them as part of the decision. If we open this, I think this is a little bit of a can of worms, especially for us, because I think it could spiral out of control. One of the things I would think is, especially with the incumbent, is solicit their idea on what they think, we, where we need to be. Yeah. Like, look, we've been doing this, as I think Mike mentioned, this way for a long time, but this is 2022. Where do you think we need to be and how are we going to structure that? How are we going to do this? Because I'd be interested in some of the established firms, especially like land use, I'd be interested in their opinion of how we could better protect ourselves. Yeah. The, and, well, sorry. just to, want to finish his thought, yep. whether our regulations are up to speed right. with holdings of the court and modern practice. Because yep. I think the zoning code in particular has got some you could drive a truck through some of that stuff. And it was really well written at the time. Yeah. It was Attorney Bobrowski wrote it. He, he wrote the book, for God's sake. Good. Yeah, right. Uh, but now I think even he would say, well, it would be time for an update, guys. Right. Yeah, the, the only concern I would have in switching lane council, unless we had a, a real bad situation with them, is you'd lose all your historical knowledge yeah. that we have within the town. We could, they remember all the different things. Um, like North Brown, for argument's sake, that goes back to 2009. You bring in a new one, and they have, now they have to come up to speed with that whole thing. What does that cost us to do that? Yeah, definitely an advantage going into a, a review, right? Yeah. So we're going to think about this a bit more. Yeah, Work in bring progress. Bring forward. Right? What's that? Bring them forward, start the discussion. I mean, at least with the incumbent, correct? Yeah. Yeah. There's no commitment to do anything else no. other than have a conversation with the incumbent. No. I suppose we can arrange that for the 21st. And they could have the some concerns on their side if yes. right. we never came together. Right. All right. Further discussion on the... I doing oh. that, Matt, but let's not um, spend as much time as we did with the uh, insurance deal. No peloton. We won't bikes. go. We won't go that deep, deep of the dive. <laughs> I wasn't responsible for that. I tried not to say anything during that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. On that note, <laughs> number eight: review and discuss uh, town administrator evaluations and possible votes. And I have a summary here was put together by the chairman, chairman and he forwarded it to me. Everyone got their um, uh, evaluations and um, I don't, the cumulative score is 92.8 out of a possible 100, which I find very high. Um, Matt is proficient in his role as town administrator. 
His experience in economic development and his firm grasp on general law has been instrumental to the success of the town and its many projects. During the pandemic, Matt quickly and efficiently established an EOC and set forward protocols and procedures that ensure the residents of our town were cared for while also protecting Town of Douglas staff and first responders. Matt has been considerate and forward thinking with the use and expenditure of FEMA, CARES Act, and ARPA funding that was allocated to the town to assist in mitigation of the impact of the COVID pandemic. Matt handles himself with professionalism and compassion and an overall positive can-do attitude that keeps Douglas moving in the right direction. And again, all of this is a summary from the, uh, the five of us. Uh, areas of possible improvement would be overall communication with staff and team members and time management and delegation of smaller tasks. Any discussion? So we look for further improvement. Well. No. I think mean, everybody, I'm sure. I didn't see anybody. You else. don't know me. 92.8 is no. not good enough for me. So. Good. Um, I agree with the points on delegation and communication. I think we had a, a spot where we got so wrapped up in what we were doing and in just day-to-day -day response to everything. We didn't, I didn't communicate effectively with staff until after the fact. So we definitely could have been ahead of the curve there. Delegation is something we're looking to do more of. Um, in particular, if the budget allows, we may be recommending, you know, a facilities manager, HR, because some of these things that I deal with are a distraction from a, having a higher set of goals for the town. Because I worry about things like leaky pipes and getting the notice on my phone. Oh my God, we have a leaky pipe, right? <clears throat> and really, yeah, I may want to know about that on Monday morning, but I don't need to know about it Saturday night, right? So some of it's about just growing, and some of it's just about, you know, you get into a rhythm of being involved with all this stuff. It's a little bit hard to divorce yourself. I think we should collectively have a session, maybe even as early as the 21st. Where we look at goals, I'm looking for the board's goals and how they might mesh with my recommendations on how to structure another year's worth of activities or even beyond that. Um, so we call them short term and medium term goals for the town because we should agree on what we're shooting for so that we're efficient about getting there. Um, we haven't done that really in a long time. I think probably the override itself generate, generated a whole bunch of goals. And a lot of them have been met. So now is the question of what do we do for follow on? Uh, and how do we cope with, <clears throat> I'll get into this in my report, but the times are wasting here, but we have some specific challenges coming up in terms of energy, inflationary pressure, and the ability to recruit and retain staff yes. that we should have a plan that we agree upon as a board and as an administration how we're going to tackle those individual problems. Uh, it's absolutely necessary. I will say for from my point of view I gave you very high marks. Um, I, I agree with the sentiments here that, that were called out of all five evaluations but uh, I think any any improvement should probably just needs to be style rather than substance, if that makes sense. Um, I think you're doing a great job. I think you've brought a lot of economic development. You've had help, without a doubt, uh, but you've brought a lot of economic development with the projects we're talking about, water and sewer and things like that, and the warehouse and things like that. Um, I'm very pleased, and any any negative points I would have would really be nitpicking, so I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I agree that, you know, there are some things we need to probably formulate some policy on, but I think, you know, look at what's been thrown at all of us at a town and as a governing board and as a town administrator in the past few years, COVID and everything else that's come along with it um, and all the after effects of it. And I think we have weathered the storm much better than a lot of communities in the same position and largely do your hard work, so I commend you. That's, I would echo that and say that moving forward on many fronts while confronting probably the biggest crisis that we've had in what, 50 or 60 years with COVID and coming up with imaginative programs for the town to deal with, 
and not be stuck with just that, but moving ahead with the longer term goals, particularly in economic development. Um, I think that's very praiseworthy and salute you for that. Thank you, sir. Yep, I got one thing to add. The um, during his re review, review process, uh, the stipulation in his contract, um, there's a there's a section in there for additional compensation for milestones being met. Um, I've reached out to the finance director to um, find out if there's a timing for that, and I was told that it has to be done within the by the last pay period of the fiscal year. That's this month. Um, is there funds in the budget for that, Jean? I'm going to have to go to either a reserve fund or an interest bill transfer for that. Yeah. Um, seeing that we may not make that decision tonight, I, w I would think that w we should instruct the finance director to move forward and get the provisions in there so the the monies are in place. So then, when we reach that decision, we can satisfy is, that obligation. Is that doable, Jean? I'll probably seek the, the interest department transfer because I don't know that it qualifies under the FinCom Reserve Fund because that's for unforeseen or extraordinary circumstances. So I'd rather do a transfer. That would require both the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee to approve it. You're both meeting the 21st. So that would. Of this, of this month. Of this month. Okay. Extraordinary that we got new business in town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to make sure everything was in place. I'm, I'm glad that was my next I read through his contract. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. yeah. And we do intend to address that, Matt, yeah. just so you're aware. Yeah. And just for folks at home, this is all public records, all right. on the website it and everything. Is. My contract has a clause in it. There's a $5,000 incentive that's tied to economic development and grants, which was met. Yes. Uh, by the metrics Many set. times over. So, yeah. That's what we're talking about <laughs> in specifics. Okay, we should put it on the agenda for the for the twenty first. Yep. Thank you, Jane. Yeah. For the transfer. For the approval. Understood. You'd need that by the twenty first. On the twenty first meeting. On the 21st. Yeah. Any further discussion? No, thank. Can we move on? Excellent. Anything? To I'm sorry. Only just because of. <laughs> good job, <laughs> the right man for the, at the right time. Um, you have a good team, and uh, just continue to foster those relationships and move the town forward. So, kudos to all involved. Kudos. Kudos. Okay. Number nine: approve minutes and possible vote. I had an excused absence at the meeting of Monday, May second. I don't know what an unexcused one is, but. I feel as if I'm back in school. Well, I, I think you were showing cold symptoms at minimum, and that's as excuse. I was as actually I was <laughs> about 1,300 miles south of here on May 2nd. So, oh, yeah. All right, so not that way. Yeah. All right. Um, make a motion that we approve the Monday, May 2nd meeting minutes. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Right. Any nays? The ayes have it. May 17th. May 17th. I'm always impressed with the amount of <coughs> work and accuracy of our minutes. I do point out a quick little typo. Um, <laughs> not to extend the meeting, but it's national grid and not nation grid. And I can't believe I just brought that up on camera. <laughs> Let's get out of here. Uh, <laughs> just for the motion. record, that was Tim oh. Bonin. Yeah, exactly. B O N I N. <laughs> make a motion that we approve the May 17 minutes with my. B O N I will edit that. With my edit. God, I know better than that. Do we have a second? Second. Motion's made and seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any nays? The eyes have it. Mr. Administrator, your report. You sure? Okay. Never mind. Mindful of the time, Mr. Chairman, yes. I will go through this quickly. First of all, I want to thank the board for the evaluation process and your compliments. 
I was at a conference last week of the Massachusetts Municipal Managers Association, and I'm able to say something that many, many of my colleagues don't say, which is that I enjoy working with my board. Um, this is the right board for the right time, too, right? There is a diversity of opinion and perspective that makes our interactions valuable to the town and moves the town forward. So <clears throat> the, the staff here can't be successful without a strong board that's engaged and uh, I appreciate the level of involvement that you all have uh, and your passion for the town. I have made three appointments, Mr. Chairman, uh, which have been posted. You were all notified. Um, the first is a new principal assessor for the town which in compliance with the act I made after consulting with the Board of Assessors. Uh, the new principal assessor is Christopher Pupka, P-U-P-K-A, who is a Douglas resident. He has been the principal assessor in the town of Oxford for the last 15 years. He has an extensive background both in assessing and information technology. So he brings a, a broad skill set to us. Um, I have reappointed Gene Lovett to the position of Municipal Finance Director. Uh, the town establishes the terms and conditions of her employment with a contract. We are still working out some of those details. We will discuss those in executive session immediately following. Um, the appointment is effective, however. It will take effect before her term runs out. And so on July 1st, you'll continue. So no time off. No, no time off. No. no time off for Gene. No days off. No furlough. Um, that's part of the contract. Zero vacation days for Gene. She has a hard time taking them anyway. <laughs> um, and lastly, I have reappointed Lisa Freeman to the role of executive assistant to the Board of Selectmen and the town administrator, but I'm making it subject to an employment contract as all allowed by Massachusetts general laws. And that section, I forget which chapter, but it's section 108N which authorizes that this specific employee may have a contract. Um, we want to do that to take this position off the compensation table and the hourly limit, uh, which has been a bit of, a, of an issue as the years have gone by. There's a meeting like this, the employees here, you know, better on 13 hours now today, can't go over 40 so that at some point in the week we're not here, which we don't want to do. Um, <clears throat> I'll move on to some projects, if there's no questions about the appointments. Appointments take effect unless you vote to disapprove them. That's how the wording of the statute is. They will take effect on their own. Oh, wow. But you may vote <laughs> on the 21st to approve the appointments if you choose to. That is your choice. Um, I think with new appointments, you can just let them go, but if you're reappointing someone, I'd respectfully request that you vote to support my decision that makes the employee. Uh, Lisa, could we put that on the agenda, of, please? Regardless yeah. of who they are. Thank you. The gym window project will start July 18th. Uh, asbestos abatement efforts will be taking place simultaneously, so as each window is cleaned up, the new window will be installed. The job will last for seven days, so we're estimating that it will be done by July 25th. The shades might be a little bit delayed due to supply chain issues. The windows were built as a single pane. So if we really insist on a mullion in the middle, they can build it in for us. But the contractor's assessment is they look beautiful the way they are, so don't, you can always add them later, I guess. Um, the next phase of the Gilboa Street water main work will begin within a week. So currently the main extension into Uxbridge is being installed. You'll notice the work is proceeding very quickly. It's night work. Um, we're already under the overpass and making our way towards the construction site. There will be some time in the next week spent around the construction site with Blackstone Valley Logistics, making the connection, pressure testing it, and making sure that it's ready for them to make their connection on their side. So that may take a few days, but once that is complete, the next phase of the project will be to replace the existing six inch main on Gilboa Street with a 12 inch main from the bridge, the North Street Bridge, up to the beginning of that, the 12 inch run. So you've seen all, you see all the pipe is lined up on the side of the street, so it's no mystery to where, where it's going. The difference will be that this work will be done during the day and will have more of an impact on the traffic 
Will we be seeing those temporary traffic lights? We will. The contractor, and and I, I mean this in all good spirits. I mean the the contractor is doing a wonderful job so far. Right. They're a very impressive group, <clears throat> but they are total Rhode Islanders, right? They're so used to having police details everywhere they go that that's all the that's the only way they feel safe. And well, they are safe. They don't, they don't trust that's those safe. lights. So those that, that, because so many people are confused by red green and yellow lights, oh my God forbid. <laughs> <We're not laughs> so How far they're, down this road would they're you expressing like some nervousness about the use of traffic lights for traffic control, but what the, the fact is we're having, works, works. The, the night details have been lucrative for people and, they, and but they've been hard to fill. They're yeah. getting harder to fill as we yep. get into vacation season. So you will, when the lights are delivered to us, which is the wild card, we'll start using them. Um, but it may not be until we do the North Street phase of the project before so we they're going to come at some point. They're going to come at some point. They, they are ordered to, to bring them in, so yeah. maybe a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the public safety radio project still on track now. Um, a member of the select board asked for an update, so I got a detailed update from the contractor and forwarded to all of you. I'll summarize that we do have two parallel tracks going on right now. So one is programming the radios and getting them ready for installation in the fleet. So the department heads met with the contractor to do the fleet mapping and all that information is being taken back to prepare for installation of hardware into vehicles. The, the, the meat of the system, um, which will be the microwave installation on two towers and the link of that back up to our fiber network, we're waiting for a structural report and release from the American Tower. The building commissioner has asked for that release to be forwarded before he issues a building permit. Once we have building permit, we'll begin to build the microwave and test the microwave system because we're all set on the Webster Tower. That's all set up. And then Spectrum is finished with their fiber network improvements. So that's pretty much done. Um, it's all been tested out. We're going back and forward with them on cleaning up their billing, but that's not really a technical issue. Any guess as to when we go online with that? I'm hoping for July, so I'm going to tell you August. Okay. Right? Yeah, because we're, before we had talked about end of June. I think that building permit issue is important. American Tower is a bureaucracy. If you've never dealt with them, that's worse than dealing with the power company or the insurance company. They're slow, they're methodical. Um, I guess that's the secret to their business, but it's all dependent on them. Yep. I know from the report from Marcus Communications that they're basically harassing this person at American Tower. They're calling every two, three days right. to, to try to dislodge this. Um, I have volunteered to call and try to light a fire under them. They don't think that's necessary just yet. Can I suggest Bob? <laughs> I know. I know where you live. Are they there? <laughs> well, just the, the point that the uh, fire chief. They'll never eat lunch again, right? spoke at the beginning of the meeting about the problems that he has with the radios. That's why I keep asking him. Yeah. Um, there, there, there were. There's a lot of things coming out of that incident. I mean, one of those is that that particular location is challenging. But we'll get back to that when it's time to test. Um, as the chief previously mentioned, we are proceeding with procurements of the fire apparatus that has been funded by both grants and by town meeting. With town meeting, there are very few manufacturers of fire engines. So it isn't necessary or useful to go out to some grand bidding process because the same people are going to respond all the time. Those manufacturers, each and every one of them, have a blanket contract approved by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So you, you basically take the contract, you build the engine that you want with the features that you want it to have, and there's your price. And you can compare price, you can compare the, the quality of the product produced by those manufacturers in the past. And that's the best way to go with such an expensive purchase. So the chiefs have selected um, Allegiant to build a Pierce Sabre. So we're going to be under budget. 
So we'll see. I don't want to venture a guess on the final price, mm. but you, you'll probably see, you know, we'll come in under the amount requested from town meeting by about $35,000 or so. As for the brush truck, we went out, we did an RFP. We obtained a competitive um, result with several bidders making proposals. After a process, we will narrowed it down to Bulldog. We're negotiating the final set of terms with Bulldog. Um, we're dealing with Ford chassis and some of these smaller components in the brush truck. There are supply chain issues. And personally, I'm strongly opposed to force majeure clauses and contracts uh, because I think a clever vendor can put just about anything into a force majeure. Yeah. It just becomes an escape hatch when they can't perform and you end up arguing over that. So our contracts do not include force majeure clauses. We are willing to negotiate compliance with the deadline for delivery of the truck in exchange for certain assurances um, and a process to document this. This is a federal grant, so there will be a federal audit. We don't want to be dangling without necessary paperwork to prove why we made certain decisions. So there's a language proposed to address all of those issues. But that's where we are with the brush truck. Because of this back and forth and the supply chain issues, we may see the engine arrive before the brush truck, even though we've had the grant for quite a while. When's the grant expire on the brush truck? June 30th, 2023. And well, we've got it in plenty of time. That's what we're hoping. September actually. Is it September? It was federal fiscal year? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but we're just hoping to get the truck. That's the we're still saying June. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we're still saying. Because that's what we put in the spec is June. Uh, we are still looking for the engineers to do the final punch list on the Cedar Street Bridge. So while the bridge is open to traffic, as the leadership of the town, you need to be aware that we haven't closed the project yet. So we're going to get that, and we won't be able to assess where we stand with the project budget until the punch list is, is done. Two more items. Uh, as you know, we have reached, we are part of a large settlement that has been reached with some of the larger defendants in the opioid uh, litigation. The estimate of our maximum award under the settlement for the town of Douglas is $348,858 to be paid to the town over 16 years. So that's, that's really like an annual injection of about $20,000, $21,000 on average. It actually varies, but let's just call that the average. There is a very tightly crafted legal document that lays out the eligibility of the use of those funds. So we will have to have meetings with the select board and with our department heads and the school department to craft an acceptable program. I have to set up our account on the portal Monday and we will have to file those, our plans for the use of the funds before we get the funds. So uh, there's an approval process that's involved. So this is on the fast track. For the most part, we have to focus on prevention and remediation of the opioid crisis, and there has to be a direct nexus between our activities and the issues that we deal with from, from the crisis. Which, by the way, if you monitor our scanner, is an ongoing and very real issue in the town of Douglas. Lastly, um, looking ahead, this is gonna be a really rough fall and winter for any Douglas resident living on a fixed income. The cost of home heating fuel and electricity is going to be at a level that many people have not experienced before. Eversource recently filed their end of year tariff rates. And while it's aggressive at 18 cents a kilowatt hour for most of the fall, in December the filed tariff is 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So if you're paying six bucks a gallon for home heating fuel and your power is 25 cents a kilowatt hour, you are going to feel a very significant pinch on your household budget. So we want to be mindful of this as we go forward with 
the adult social center and lining people up with appropriate programs for financial support who are qualified for it and also to be sensitive to our citizens' needs as we go into uh, this winter and working with the state to try to figure out how we're going to meet those needs. Um, <clears throat> I have asked the question, and I got a ridiculously long answer, of our electricity aggregate contract and whether or not the rates that we, so if Douglas residents who are in the aggregation program are not going to be subject to 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So first and foremost, if you're not in the aggregation program and you have a fixed income, you'd better hurry up and join us because it's going to get pretty aggressive this, this fall and winter. So the question, since we're talking about force majeure, is will the electricity generators providers invoke the war in Ukraine and other reasons for the constriction of natural gas supply and the increase in prices of electricity as a way to escape their contract with us because I think we're at 10.7 cents a kilowatt hour. Right now there has been no such discussion with our aggregator with Good Energy or anybody involved in the contract but as the author of my, the response said to me today, you, you know, as we get closer to the date, you might see some pressure for that. Um, we feel like we have a strong legal position to defend against it. Uh, a lot of our disturbances are due to the way ISO New England is structured and the way we buy power for this region of the country. And there's, that's not any, that, that's always been there. We have always paid more for electricity than everybody else around. And um, some of this has to do with some national en energy policies that are being put in place as well. It's not a t it is not a good time to be doing some of the things that are being done, um, just interfering with the market in a, di in a difficult way. So that is the end of my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. One quick question on the sure. um, residents on the fixed income. Does that, um, would they qualify under the opera funds? I've seen that on the news where they've done it in different cities around the Commonwealth. I just didn't know if that's a consideration since we're in the opera fund discussion. How do you determine that? Don't know. The city of Cambridge, I think it was, is uh, for a year and a half they're going to give um, people under a certain threshold $500 a resident or something like that per month. Okay. It's worth investigation. I mean, we have State exemptions. Excuse me? State was going to send out $500, I think. Well, the uh, city was doing it with their APA funds. Yeah. You could investigate the pl plausibility of tying it to an exemption. Well, and the face, income face exemption. with what yeah. some of the uh, population is going to suffer over the winter. It might be a consideration since yeah. we're looking at the use of these funds. I will look into it. Open session for topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance of the meeting. Hearing nothing, I'm going to turn to Selectman Bonin for one of his well-worded motions. All right. I make a motion that we move into executive session for the purposes of collective bargaining and then to leave executive session for the sole purpose of adjourning. I'll second. I'll second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> no, no, no. Motion's made and seconded. I need a roll call vote. Something Tim said. Fitzpatrick, aye. Cortez, aye. Davis, aye. The ayes have it. Thank you. Well,